My name is Ashish Punjabi, the Chief Outfit Operating Officer of Jackie's Business Solutions in Dubai. What's the portfolio of solutions as of today? So within the business solutions area, we're in largely two areas. One is what we call visitor management. And visitor management encompasses things like queuing management systems, happiness meters, uh, digital signage, and also humanoid robotics. The other part of our businesses are more related on printing uh, technology. So that can be 3D printing, large format printing, and other digital manufacturing technologies that go along with that. So fantastic. Let's go to the second part first, because uh, which is the, the production area. So two key things which are happening there is the uh, digital, the, the, the 3D printing, right? Which is faster uh, visibility of, of, a, of an end product. Uh, in the last three, four, five years, a lot of things have been happening. I don't see too much of innovation on the printer itself. Has they, have they become faster, they're more effective in, trans, in translating 3D graphics into final <coughs> results? Has there been any significant changes over there? So from the printer side, there have been some advances, but I think the bigger thing has been in terms of materials. And, and, and where the industry had to evolve was in terms of material capabilities and what the materials could do. And I think a lot of focus has gone into that. Uh, ABS-like materials uh, has, has been a focus area for a lot of them. Getting into more composite uh, applications, uh, so fiberglass, carbon fiber, these type of things were there. And metal. Metal has been the big innovation overall in the 3D printing industry uh, that, is, that has come out. Uh, so I think that has been one major thing. The other thing has been the price points have also changed quite dramatically over the last couple of years, where you had the desktop level, which was at a few thousand dollars, and then you had the industrial, which was going into hundreds of thousands at times. And now you sort of got a middle ground that has grown, and that's actually been the growth area for the last uh, three, four years, which is sort of the, the, the commercial desktop, if you want to call it that which sort of sits between the ten to $30,000 mark. Um, and that is something that could do the production of what was a couple of hundred thousand dollars a few years ago. So we have seen uh, some initiatives on a large scale production, the factory type of thing. Are we really there yet or these are still proof of concepts of the real factories? Uh, when we had the digital printing, digital uh, material printing, uh, you had to go for smaller size, you know, step by step by step before finally we got to the uh, flatbed printing. Uh, the, uh, is the 3D printing still progressing that way? And, or has it actually reached a level where you can have a full-fledged factory commercially valid? So I think the where it is right now is 3D printing isn't going to be the only solution. Uh, if you talk about digital manufacturing today or digital fabrication, you need to have a combination of subtractive and additive manufacturing technologies put together. And what we're seeing are advances on both. Uh, and then this is sort of where we've been involved. On the 3D printing side, still a lot of it is on the prototyping uh, elements, uh, and that helps shorten the design iterations, uh, customize things better, do a lot of that type of work. And in some areas, you are seeing more manufacturing, uh, especially where it's smaller volumes and highly customized. So the aircraft industry and things of that have been moving towards that a lot quicker. Uh, but where you're actually seeing a lot of the transformation has been on the subtractive manufacturing side because a lot of that has gone digital. Uh, so we work, uh, we do a brand called Zund, which does cutting machines, for example. Uh, and, and these can cut at high accuracy, replace a lot of the, the human uh, labor that could be there, uh, much more efficient, uh, and doesn't make the same mistakes. So you have higher quality output. And that is something that is being used a lot more over here in manufacturing. Uh, so we see markets like that uh, starting to grow, where that would be in something where someone was manually cutting or someone was manually processing. That's getting automated, and that's actually moving into the production areas a lot faster. So this basically uh, return investment on selective areas, of, uh, which are traditionally production. Well, it's a combination. You need to have the two things there. Uh, the additive is a lot more on the prototyping and the development side. The subtractive at the moment, from an economies of scale perspective, has been far better on the manufacturing side. Uh, but I think the two are getting closer and closer together. And I think as you put the whole thing together, you start to see the, the final we're digital missing, factory. We're still missing uh, some of the, the commercial use cases, right? I mean, if it is uh, 
the medical healthcare side, on the dental side, on the car side, aircraft side. The, the commercial use cases are still missing. Would so, you agree? So, I wouldn't agree entirely because dental has actually been one of the quickest and one of the best. Uh, so I don't think there is any dental lab today that doesn't heavily depend on, on uh, additive manufacturing. Uh, most of them have got 3D printers in there. And for them, the costs have come down quite significantly over the last couple of years. So while we're not involved in that sector ourselves, uh, we have been involved in the past and, and we have seen that, that sector grow, uh, where today everyone has got that. And it is something that's going to continue to evolve because what you're seeing now is a lot of people had access to this technology for the first time when they were in the schooling system, schools and universities. And with this technology now being five or six years over here in, in education, you're starting to see kids graduate and come out of these universities with those native skills. I mean, not only here, we see it from people from, from across the region, even from the Indian subcontinent, coming here who now understand 3D printing right off the bat because they've learned it in school or they've learned it at university. And they're starting to apply this over here. And I think what we're looking at at the moment is we're in a region where there was no manufacturing traditionally. We imported everything. We were net importers of everything that came in. And we're now at a stage where we're starting to create and we don't have any legacy as far as a manufacturing base, which is what is hampering the rest of the world because they've been manufacturing, they've been trained in a certain way, they have processes, they have a factory floor that's been doing things in a certain fashion. And now over here, you're starting with a blank sheet of paper and saying, if I had to start manufacturing, how would I do it today? And they're starting to adopt this. But you aren't going to go from zero to 100 in one day or one year. It's something that's going to happen, but that curve is going to move a lot faster for us. Let's look at the other side of the business, which is the robotics, the cube management. The cube management, we see uh, some of the solutions where on a mobile you can get you know, your cube or something. What's happening? What's the innovation on the cube management? So the big thing is data. Uh, what, what a queuing management system provides ultimately to the customer is data about who comes in, when they come in, how long they're served, what efficiency levels and whether people are satisfied with the service. Now whether that queue comes in through a paper ticket on a printer, whether it goes straight by SMS or through a mobile app, these are all things that we're involved in today and that we're developing uh, and working with, with a lot of our customers on. Uh, so this has been there and the analytics I think is the key to it because today everyone wants to understand their customer that much better and the emphasis that we've seen with the governments in the region, especially in the UAE, where all the government centers are being rated uh, and being named and shamed in this uh, instance as well, it's gotten even more important for them to have a better system in place. Interesting, very interesting. Let's go to the robotics uh, side of it. So, uh, you launched uh, SoftBank's uh, customer engagement uh, robots, and uh, a lot of the government organizations took that as a prototype and they started using it in the banks. And, uh, it was uh, the apps also, you built some of the communities for building those, uh, developing those. Where have you progressed the over the last 12 months? <laughs> So we've had a lot of progress in the humanoid robot space. The first thing that we did is we now have a repair center locally based, uh, which means we can do most of the repairs on the robots locally in the region. Uh, the scenario a year ago was you had to send everything back to Paris, which was the headquarters of the SoftBank Robotics Division. So if a hand fell off, a finger fell off, a head fell off, you sent everything back. This is the only other service facility in the whole EMEA region uh, which can do this now. Uh, so for anyone in the region over here, we can now take it and, and repair it here. That saves a lot in terms of logistics and freight and trying to explain to VAT and customs why you shouldn't be at duty and VAT on the product being coming back to you after repairs. That's one. The other part of it has been the software. Uh, so we've been actively engaging in building up a software developer community over here. And we've started to do some deployments with them. Uh, so one of the first deployments we did over here was a chatbot integration for Burkhan Bank over here in Kuwait. Uh, that has just gone live, uh, where they now have a locally developed chatbot solution working in the bank over there, and this is something we want to move into other places. Uh, we've had customers like Diva who've been doing a lot of the development work in-house and have been trained by us. Uh, we have Oracle who came on board uh, in the last year. Uh, so Oracle are now developing uh, applications for Pepper. Uh, and are exhibiting at this stand as well at Jaitings this year. 
So we've seen some efforts from that side. Uh, one of the big things that we've done this year and what we're introducing at the show for the first time is a robot content management system uh, that we're launching over here as well. That allows end users or dealers to deploy robots a lot faster. It allows them to do the setup and do a lot of the integration work uh, themselves. Uh, it's sort of like designing a website on your own. So we're trying to automate and fix that process in such a way that they can customize, develop, and design. So it's like using Wix.com or Squarespace. One question. The app was one thing. What about the voice uh, the responses? Did we, has that progressed in terms of the, of the ability to hear the sound and talk? So that is something that's always improving. Uh, there have been a couple of firmware upgrades that have happened in the last year. The technology was something that was built many years ago with all these sensors and, and cameras in it. And with each firmware upgrade, they're either enabling more of these sensors or improving them. Uh, so one of the examples was the proximity sensor that was there. Uh, the proximity sensor a year ago would wait for someone to come in front and would then start interacting. It's now enabled where if someone's coming from the side, it turns to the side and it recognizes you and follows you till you're here and starts talking to you as well. So nothing changed from the hardware perspective. It's an optimization of the, of the sensors that were in there. So you mentioned some very interesting things about the region uh, being able to come to terms with the sort of transformation innovation it needs to go through. What's the, uh, specifically what has triggered your, uh, I mean this, this tip, I mean, has there been actual end users, your end users taking in charge of the transformation, is it actual orders, is it actual <coughs> projects which are coming up that you feel well, I mean, this is a city that's always been looking uh, at the future. Uh, I think something like the Dubai Expo has added impetus to that because now everyone's looking at how do they showcase the city next year. Uh, the emphasis in terms of customer service and happiness has been a major element that we've seen over here. And I think that has played a huge part in terms of what people want to do. And it's not just transformation for the sake of transformation. It's transformation for the sake of betterment. And, and quantifiable betterment is what we're starting to see. Uh, so it's not people saying we want a song and dance show. It's people saying we have a use case scenario and how do we do this better? How many steps can we cut off? How do we optimize what we're doing? Is the loop being completed for business in terms of the monetary return? So what you're saying is very important that yes, okay, we can improve. I mean, we we'll take the happiness meters and all that. But is the loop being completed into a financial gain? That, you know, if my happiness is sitting at the top and first and second consistently, this actually means that more people are going to come back more frequently and transact more with the government, for example. Is the loop being completed? I, I think so. I think definitely so. Because if you look at it, the better you serve someone, the more loyalty you gain. That's the only way you get loyalty today. There's no other means of loyalty. Uh, you can say anything else about the loyalty scheme, but good service brings back good customers. And I think this is what they're starting to see. The fact that you can serve in different means in different channels, whether it be digital, whether it be online, whether it be physical, uh, doesn't make a difference. The customer has to be served and you need to be where the customer is. Do you agree that when a person presses the happiness meter, it is not just that experience, but it's the overall experience which they reflect and then use the, the, the meter to reflect the overall impression, right? For sure. I think I see myself as a consumer. Uh, if, if you are upset, you click the frowny face. But if you're genuinely happy, there is a sense of pride in, smel in pressing the smiley face as well. If someone has gone out of the way to do it, you will do that. I've been in, in retail stores where someone has gone out of the way to help me, even though I'm not their customer. And then I've seen this meter there, and I've gone impressed it because they've gone, they've done something out of their way for me, and that deserves to be recognized.